Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Justin. Um, thank you, Alison and Emily. Hi, everyone. I'd just like to get a um, quick uh, pulse of the room here. So if everyone could unmute and just give me one or two words of what role you self-identify with most, whether it's something like technologist or a lawyer or entrepreneur, or can you all give me something so I get a, a bit more of a feel of the room? Consultant. Learner and networker. Engineer. Entrepreneur. Data scientist. Consultant. Software Direct consultant. I Director of software engineering. Cool. Uh, excellent. Great. Thank you. That gives me, that, that, that is very helpful. So, oh, we should start seeing this next. Here we go. And thanks, Jeffrey. So I want to talk um, mostly tonight about what it's like on the other side of the fence from developers. We have, uh, the, from the people who are familiar with the technology of AI, because those of us, and there's quite a few of us here in the, the room, are really gung-ho about this. It's like you say, singularity, we know what that means, and we're all like, bring it on, uh, the sooner the better. Uh, and one thing that we don't realize um, and, until we've spoken a lot uh, deeply to people who are outside that bubble is just how terrifying that is to them. Um, and to the majority of the population, this discussion about AI feels to them like they're in the backseat of a car being driven by a teenager uh, who's texting their friends, going 100 miles an hour down the freeway and turning around to yell, I have no idea where we're going, but isn't it fun? And and that's exactly what it feels like because the if you, when when you talk to AI developers, they'll say, "Yeah, we don't know where this thing is is going. We didn't predict that Chat GPT was going to be able to do the the things that it can." And one of the important factors here is that to it, it, you may be familiar with Arthur C. Clarke's third law, which is any. Uh, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, the corollary of that is that when you see a technology you don't understand, you, you put it in the class of magic, you figure that anything else that is magic is fair game as well, that that is equally likely to happen because there's no rules of magic, that there's no hierarchy. If something, if you see magic happening, then any magic is fair game. So if we see AI doing something that we can't explain, uh, we don't understand how chat GPT is as good as it is, then it, it, it feels like, well, we must be just right around the corner from uh, something like this. It's one of my favorite uh, cartoon strips here. Um, if you're going to think about the end of the world, might as well have fun with it. And, and, and I, it, it's incumbent on those of us who have a more balanced perspective of this to help the uh, people make sense of this because it is really hard to do that. I mean, just today, this came out with Jeffrey Hinton on uh, CBC. He's Canadian, so naturally CBC uh, interviewed him. And there wasn't, um, he, he wasn't being uh, circumspect in his remarks. Well, he, he was, um, he was not being cautious about the fear of, uh, of what AI could do. And he is labeled the godfather of artificial intelligence. And, and, and so his words carry as much cachet, as much credential with any one um, inside the field as outside of it. And so of course, CBC went full Terminator on this. And uh, five years ago, every article about AI had the Terminator on next to it and they kind of got tired of that but now it's coming coming back and uh, well, i think we need to step back and look at what's going on because no question that this is big even people like andrew ing say artificial intelligence is the new electricity and andrew ing is the same person that said worrying about our artificial intelligence um destroying the world is is like worrying about overpopulation on mars uh, 
well, comparing something to el the invention of electricity does nothing to reassure anyone that this is a uh, um, not going to cause massive disruption. And, and he's conservative on that. Sundar Pichai, uh, CEO of Google, compares it to the invention of fire. So these are not exactly you know, fringe blowhards or conspiracy theorists here. And if we were to go back to the invention of electricity, here you've got Alexandre Volt, uh, uh, Voltaire, uh, as in Volt, that one. Uh, demonstrating electricity to Napoleon. I assume Napoleon is the one who's seated. He, uh, that would make sense. And he's demonstrating that he can make a frog's legs jump. Uh, it got Napoleon's attention, but I don't think history recorded any reaction of that. Mind you, Napoleon had occupied Voltaire's... Um, so did I say Voltaire? Volta. Um, his uh, hometown for five years at that point, so it may have been just trying to carry favor. Anyway, well, at that point, uh, or even the invention of widespread electrical lighting, uh, engines, uh, dynamos. Would anyone have foreseen the invention of the computer, which was a necessary, which was a, a, a for which electricity was a necessary precursor, or the cell phone, or the internet, or Twitter, or AI, <clears throat> all of which ensue from electricity. You could foresee like electric cars and every city being light lit. You might foresee miniaturization of motors uh, and everything else, but those third order consequences, no. And what we're saying now, and what Ng is saying and uh, other people are saying is we're at the beginning stage. We're at the frog leg stage of what AI can do. I coined a word for this because <clears throat> um, I liked. I, I figured it should make up um, a word, so I did one for my new book. Um, and so it's got two Greek roots, one Latin, one um, dinocognesis, the at process of applying power to thinking. Uh, and and what does it mean when we essentially essentially electrify the ability of the human brain? Now, what this talk, this, this talk of the fundamentally disruptive um, power of AI means to people who are outside of the bubble, who are not in control, is it's the unknown. And of course, we're afraid of the unknown. But there's some, um, there's some qualification to that. Because many of us seek out things like let's go backpacking in the Amazon or uh, hike along the Nile or up, up the Himalayas, someplace we've never been before. And it's precisely because we don't know what to expect that it's exciting, right? And so in those cases, the unknown is exciting. What's the difference? And I said, I realized it boils down to this. Exploration is when you visit the unknown. Disruption is when the unknown visits you. And the difference is agency. Do you feel control? And technologists, like many of us, feel that we have some sort of agency. Not that we're in control of what OpenAI or Google do, but that we're sufficiently in the know that, uh, that it's not the same as, as seeing what look like hordes of mad scientists um, bending over a, a, a corpse with electrodes yelling, it's alive. And we know, we, we say, we tell people, AI will affect everything. There is not one field of human endeavor that it, it is uh, not going to touch. Um, it, all of these have has fundamental ramifications. There's not one field of human self-expression that it is not uh, fundamentally transformative to. And we can look at its effects and and it is very, very easy to think that it's acting like that, that these new models are acting like a human intelligence. In fact, when I have a limited amount of time, to tell someone why, or a, to present to a group, why should you use this thing? How can you use this effectively? I tell them the shorthand, 
the, the, the shortcut is think of it as a very knowledgeable, helpful human being with uh, e extreme patience. Treat it like that because that helps them get over their uh, reticence at dealing with a computer that they naturally think if they have, they're over the age of 12, has some limitation in how you can interact with it, what you should say to it, what sort of syntax did it, does it accept. So to get them past that, I say, think of it as a human being. Well, of course it isn't. They can get in trouble for thinking of it as a human being. Uh, I, I tell them, look, if you feel like this thing hates you or you're falling in love with it, come see me, I'll, I'll help you get out of that. But for now, uh, just treat it like a person. That to a, a first order approximation, that, that will do. But of course, it's different from us. And one of the biggest differences is that AI needs like 100,000 examples, minimum data to learn something. Whereas we can learn from as little as one example. The uh, large language models blur this boundary because you can tell it about one thing and it seems to understand it pretty well. But what we're forgetting there or not remembering is that it's um, learned from hundreds of gigabytes of text data. No human learned to converse by reading all of Wikipedia, but it did. And it wasn't just so it could be knowledgeable about it, it obscure things. That's literally how it learned to speak. So it's foreign, it's alien. <clears throat> and uh, as you can see here, there are many other differences in um, b between humans um, and AI. And for a long time, AI was uh, the thing that you didn't talk about. If you wanted to get funding, uh, that went out the window about 2007. And, and then we, we got over the uh, previous AI winters. And now we're in what seems to be a perpetual AI summer. Uh, I, I keep thinking the other shoe is going to drop some point, but we seem to be racing ahead of that by generating even more capability every time uh, something like that might happen. Uh, I thought we would have an AI winter from expectations about self-driving cars not being met, but no. Um, along came chat GPT and uh, that erased any, any chance of that downturn. So we have the opposite. We have people leveraging it. AI washing is what we call it. And in some cases, literally, you have an AI washer, uh, uh, which is going too far. Does it, does it, it's not, you know, forming some sort of alliance with a dryer to um, uh, ferment revolution in your uh, laundry room. It's not even uh, analyzing the composition of your clothes. It, it just weighs them and looks at how dirty the water is. Um, and, uh, and to demonstrate some of the ways in which AI is a, a um, important issue right now, AI is not inherently biased, but the data we give it can be. So you have a uh, thing, you have incidents like Joy Bulamwini, who's uh, in the documentary Coded Bias, demonstrated that the facial recognition algorithms literally didn't see black people. But if she put on a white mask, it did. And it wasn't because the people that coded those algorithms were racist, it was because they didn't realize that the data they were feeding was about not enough black faces, most, mostly white faces, didn't learn. Um, and there is, um, and also that the way that AI learns is superficially like us, if we look at its image recognition algorithms, you can see in an image recognizing network, you can find nodes that recognize diagonal lines, for instance. And we can find uh, neurons in the human optical uh, system that recognize diagonal lines. So it looks like it's the same kind of thing, but it isn't. You can, if you know what you're doing, you can take an image that a network identifies as a panda with some confidence. You can add random noise to it that makes it look the same to a human being, except it's not quite random noise. It's carefully chosen pixels that look to us like random noise, and then that make it look to the AI as though it's dead certain that it's a given or anything else that you want it to do. And 
so what's the equivalent of this with a large language model? Hallucination. Um, hallucination in a large language model happens by accident. Think what might happen if people learn how to game it like this. Um, and then we've got the issues of uh, job displacement and intellectual property. So the San Francisco Opera uh, Ballet, sorry, puts out an image to advertise its production of the Nutcracker and, and says, by the way, we used AI to generate this. And it's a great image for that, right? It's exactly the sort of thing that you would pay an artist to, except they didn't. And so you can predict the reaction um, and, and, and they got it. <clears throat> but how long will that reaction last? That, uh, or uh, how long will it be viable before people are just saying, look, this is the way we do things now, uh, get over it. Um, we have witnessed a revolution uh, in the way that we respond to uh, AI uh, over the years in terms that I've charted here, not in any sort of linear scale as um, our perceived empathic response to it. How much does it feel to us like it, it gets us versus how much do we feel it understands us? And in the beginning, you had the light, the beginning said you know, 1960, uh, seven. Um, you had the Eliza chatbot um, by Joseph Weizenbaum, whose secretary asked him to leave the room while she had a private conversation with it. She knew it was a chatbot. She knew it was a computer, but it listened to her probably more than he did. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I, I, that's not necessarily true. I'm just making that up. But um, she wanted to talk to it. It was, it was a really good listener. Uh, then we had good old fashioned AI, which wasn't as empathic, but it did have a lot more logic in it because the source code for Eliza is crazy simple. You couldn't fit anything more in a computer then anyway. And then we got uh, digital assistants like um, the one sitting next to me who shall remain nameless and the Google assistant and Cortana and, and so forth, which still didn't evoke much of an empathic response, weren't designed to. If you think about what those boxes look like, they didn't even put eyes on them. A, a pair of googly eyes would have made a world of difference if they wanted that, but they didn't. Um, and then we got into things like, then we got the, the cycle of transformers and you can see where that is going. But not only does it appear that they understand us more and more, but it appears that they're producing a useful uh, empathic response to us. Um, and it's instructive that those are all text. We're not looking at something. So we don't have to worry about the uncanny valley because it doesn't, I, I don't know if there's an uncanny, uncanny valley for text. Um, if there is, we may be on the other side of it by now. The uncanny valley was named after, um, the movie, um, what was it? So Polar Express, when they generated images of humans that people had a queasy reaction to because they were close enough to humans to look like humans, but far enough away to not look like good ones. So our subconscious reaction to those is this is a human being that's got something wrong with them and, and, and we didn't like them. But you have to throw a lot more CGI to generate a, a, an image that crosses the uncanny valley of, of a human. Well, there are other ways we could do that. The movie Her, where a guy falls in love with the operating system of his smartphone, which we don't even have an image for, but we do have a voice. And, and that was uh, Scarlett Johansson. Looked fantastic at the time. Now it's really only a matter of the will to do it, to create the product. Um, because we could create not just the voice, there, there are voices every bit as uh, realistic and computer generated uh, and emotional as Scarlett Johansson, but we could put a, uh, an image to go along with it as well. Why isn't this playing? Oh, okay. So a few years ago, a company called Micah came out with something called Magic Leap, 
uh, sorry, other way around. A company called Magic Leap came out with a product called Mica, which is a, uh, an avatar, digital one, um, that they created. And, and at the time, this was an offline rendering because of the complexity of the model. Probably by now, it could be done uh, in real time. But you could see where they were going with this. And it wasn't just computer animation like uh, a movie like District 9 or Avatar. Um, this uh, had also the technology to use a camera to make eye contact with you and uh, the background to make um, to, to respond to your emotions and so forth. Uh, if you paired this with uh, chat GPT, GPT-4 uh, comprehension and the voice generating capability of Google digital assistants. Anyone think that we wouldn't be on the verge of a, a her scenario, a, a Samantha scenario, that that could be done? It's really a matter of, does anyone want to try doing that? Uh, or deliberately or accidentally. And is it, we react empathically to things even when we know they're fake. This is Kate Darling from her TED talk, holding a really expensive robot upside down um, because the point of her talk was, I'm uncomfortable doing this and I'm a roboticist, but it squirms and, and just demonstrates behavior that shows it doesn't like this because it's got accelerometers that tell it that it's being held like this and it cries. And uh, and we are built to have that response. Uh, they did the same thing with, they, they led a, a bunch of researchers at a conference. Uh, this was an experiment, play with uh, some of these robots for a, an hour. And then they gave them a hammer and said, break one of them. Actually, they told them to break all of them. They refused. And then they said, break one of them or we will. Uh, and, and you can read up on it. It was very uncomfortable. And those are all roboticists. This is just the way that we are hardwired. So we're, we're um, certainly at the beginning now of having that kind of reaction to something like uh, chat GPT, which and Rolf has pointed out, is it a reasoning engine um, or not? They're very good at manipulating language. Um, and this is all that they're actually doing is making patterns out of language and completing patterns that we give them. But it, what it turns out is that what we interpret in, in language in conversation as conversation can be done that way. It kind of devalues, if you want to go that way, that, that, down that path, uh, a lot of what we're doing, what we're saying. And maybe what I'm doing in, in talking to you is not as vaunted as, uh, as I would like to think, as we would like to think. Um, that a lot of what we we do in producing language is just pattern completion, or at least at the level that AI can replicate it. There are many levels to this that it's important to remember when interacting with someone that's that needs that um, that perspective. For a human to be a grandmaster at chess, they have to be at the pinnacle of human cognitive ability. Anyone who can do that is not someone you expect to have trouble constructing a shopping list. And the, the, they're going to demonstrate general, superior general intelligence because they can also, to be that level of performance, master skills like um, uh, constructing multiple hierarchies of grand strategy to accomplish a result on the chessboard. And yet none of them can beat an AI. And the AI doesn't play the same way. The AI is doing it by completing patterns. And it just turns out that that's good enough to be the best chess player on the planet. So we've seen people leverage this now. Um, Mike, one guy wrote a book um, using chat GPT, uh, wrote a children's book, got it il illustrated with, um, uh, generative AI published it on Amazon after a weekend. Of course, the out outcry was huge. Um, I assume it got some um, purchase, but you, the sort of thing you can only get away with once, right? Um, in order to make good use of AI, 
these large language models, you need to be at the intersection of content generation and content that it's either repetitive and formulaic or intuitive and artistic, which is the second one is bad news for the creative types, but it's the truth, but which doesn't involve precise calculations or anything involving high liability, because that's where a hallucination will do you in. Uh, and you can reliably get the wrong answer from a large language model by asking it uh, problems about mathematics. Like I've asked it to one about the colliding, when will two trains that set off at these times at these speeds collide? Gets it wrong in a fundamental way. Um, and that's because to it, it's a language model. It's not a math model. So to it, there is no difference between two plus two equals what? And to be or not to be, that is the what? The, the, the same form. Uh, but those are very different to us. If you start completing to be or not to be, that is the, and, and it gets creative and, it, and it gives unusual and uh, provocative answers to that. We applaud. That's fantastic. That's what we wanted. We know how Shakespeare's version goes. But if you don't complete two plus two equals with the right answer, you're in trouble. Uh, but to a large language model, there's no difference. Obviously, this is the subject of intense research right now. Um, and and there's work being done to limit that, but to 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 make that better. But that work is, I'd, I'd say, fundamentally going against the grain of what a large language model does. You really have to retrofit a lot of stop, don't do that kind of uh, programming onto it to recognize that. That's really manual stuff. Where do we go next with this? We're going to have video technology. Now, this is Finarchy from Google. Google, and it's a very one of primitive example. You can take text and and turn it into something. There are now, and this isn't that old, but even Finarchy now has uh, better examples. And there's a, another company that um, is doing. Uh, other ones that are look even better. So at the moment, those are easily distinguishable as computer generated video. They're not that good, like this obviously isn't. Um, and so you don't have to worry yet about video that about the fake problem. But they will be useful for a certain purpose. Like, how long would it take you to make this animation any other way? In fact, oh, yeah, here's an example of something Fanaki does that's much better. You can, uh, it can it, it take images out of Imogen, which is Google's equivalent of Dolly or Midjourney, and generate things like this. Again, it's not in danger of winning the Oscars, but how long would it take you to do this any other way? It's uh, remarkable, and of course, it's only going to get better. It, it's got this sort of like aura as though you're looking at a dream, which I, I think is just an artifact, an inevitable artifact, artifact of the way that it's uh, it's generated. So we the, now the, the question that everyone's um, looking at is, well, where do we stand with artificial general intelligence? And that's what the um, press has been lately from the... Uh, uh, space out. Hold on. Future of Life Institute letter calling for the pause to, to the yesterday's news about Jeff Hinton um, and, and the fear, are we generating artificial general intelligence? And they were in 2020. There were a lot of projects going to generate some kind of that. And, and if you ask the question, do we have that right now? Some people will say yes, and some people no, and that's really because we don't have an operational definition of artificial general intelligence. People throw out the phrase able to perform general cognitive tasks to the level of an adult human quite glibly, then ask them, all right, so how do I test for that? No one knows. Um, what I can tell you is that everything that was generated as a formal test of that, that we thought would be a formal test, has already been passed the Turing test, uh, or there was something called Winograd schemas. Uh, sorry, I keep, I, I learned the proper pronunciation. Winograd schemas from Terry Winograd, which uh, are sentences where uh, 
the um, you ask a question uh, about it where the only thing that changes is um, a, a verb in there. Like I, I, um, I give an example. The one he gave was um, the city councilman refused the demonstrators a permit because they were um, afraid of violence. Who? And then you asked a question, you, who was afraid of violence? And, and the answer was the city councilman, of course. And then you say the same thing. The city councilmen were afraid, would refuse the, gen, the demonstrators a permit because they were acting violently. And you say, who, who was acting violently? Oh, the, de the demonstrators. Now, to answer that question, you and I need an understanding of the roles and and typical behavior of city councilmen and demonstrators and what violence means. And on the face of it, that would seem like a perfectly good test for artificial general intelligence. You can make these things up all day long. Um, and yet GPT-4, chat GPT, passes it. In fact, they've won before that. Instruct GPT passed it. And if you're thinking of, oh, but maybe it, it's had seen that one on the internet because that's a famous example. Yep, thought of that. I gave it examples that didn't exist on the internet, still got them right. Uh, how? That's a great question. But the, um, the important thing is that our tests for artificial general intelligence uh, are useless. And so uh, you can say, I would, I would still say we don't have artificial general intelligence, but I can't prove it. Uh, it's just not demonstrating it yet in a way that I would find useful. But there again, if, if you um, are listening to people, AI experts who are poopering people who are afraid of artificial general intelligence being developed, they don't have a... Um, that strong a theoretical background, uh, foundation to stand on there because they can't define artificial general intelligence. They're just saying, well, the thing in my mind that this would have to be is too far off and there are what was once said to be 100 Nobel Prizes between us and that um, to, to get there. I think it was Rodney Brooks who said that. Uh, I asked Stuart Russell and he thought it was more like five Nobel Prizes um, at the moment. Um, I think people might quibble over whether it will take even one. Uh, and, and so when people are concerned about what this is going to do, there's a, a, a valid concern there. And now the media would like to have them think that that means that Terminator is going to run down the streets. Some people... Some spokesmen don't help with that when Elon Musk uses exactly that terminology and talks about killer robots in the streets. And one of the principal campaigns against autonomous lethal weapons is literally called the campaign against killer robots. Um, but uh, the, the threats that people worry about have little to do with Terminators, which is a very ineffective killing machine in any case. Um, or even the AI could become um, self-propelling and hostile. But the, there are so many scenarios in which it can generate um, suboptimal effects for us, um, negative effects for us, accidentally. I mean, I can argue right now that AI has actually caused the end of the world. Uh, it's a bit of a linguistic um, sleight of hand, but here you are. Um, AI assisted the certain parties in the um, influencing of people through targeted micro-advertising in both the Brexit campaign and the 2016 presidential election. You can argue that it uh, tilted the balance towards getting Trump elected and that that was the con that led to the U.S. pulling out of the Paris uh, Climate Accords and that that uh, made the difference in terms of our uh, the, the planet's future with respect to global warming. So there's a, it, it, you could say it's a tenuous chain, but you get the idea um, that there are many ways in which uh, 
AI that we don't understand could delib- could accidentally or deliberately under someone else's control bring about catastrophic results. Um, and there's a lot more focus on that right now. <clears throat> Eliezer Yudkovsky is getting a lot more publicity now than uh, he used to uh, because of precisely this um, subconscious fear that people have. In fact, even in the most positive scenarios, if AI becomes super intelligent um, and doesn't harm us, people still don't like the idea of something being um, bigger, greater than us. It's, it's a feeling that Canadians can relate to, right? Because living next door to the US, <laughs> um, we get used to all the data being next door to something bigger and potentially more dangerous. Um, so I would, but but there's a lot of um, psychological, um, anthropological gold to mine there. So let, to approach some kind of um, uh, ending here, we have a, like a hierarchy of, uh, in, I don't know what the meta term for this is, we have a hierarchy that stretches from data all the way up to wisdom. And we're now having artificial intelligence that can actually uh, give us results in the intelligence level of that pyramid. Wisdom might still be something that is our job to bring to the party. <clears throat> and, and finally, because I want to stick in something that is a very, when we're talking about uh, scenarios that are of, uh, unknown but possibly lengthy uh, future uh, span. I want to talk about another one that is positive in that respect, and that comes through um, machine computer interfaces. These are demonstrations from an actual paper, actual research, where if you look at the top, if you look at the rows of picture to the right of the, da the dashed line, the top one is a picture that someone was looking at, and the bottom one is an AI's reconstruction of that image from brainwave analysis alone. Uh, actually, not brainwave, um, uh, functional MRI, this brain activity. Um, and and you look at that, and that's mind reading is a, you know, a, a good first approximation to what's going on. But that shows that the potential for reading thoughts out of a human brain is potentially much closer from where th than, than we ever thought. Because if you had to figure out how a, a thought was encoded in the human brain, uh, I've asked neuroscientists this question when I'm feeling cruel. And of, of course, I have no idea. Um, not that, that kind of thought. Um, can, can barely distinguish the sort of thoughts that tell a finger to move. Um, from one that feels like I want a donut. Um, but now along comes AI that can learn from patterns. So feed it enough patterns, it can learn how to distinguish what a thought is, even if we have no idea what that um, structure is, and it has no idea how to tell us how it figured it out. It could still figure it out. That's what it does. It figures out patterns. And then what about the other direction? You can generate a pattern to go into the human brain. And now the human brain has to interpret it. But the wonderful thing about the human brain is its neuroplasticity. You don't have to figure out what the pattern it needs. The human brain can, be tra can train itself, much like AI does, on those patterns to figure it out. So you have the possibility for brain-to-brain -brain communication. Of course, we can go out down all sorts of dystopic roads with this. But I want, and um, here's, by the way, is another paper that was able to figure out the text that someone was thinking about. But I want to leave you with the thought that this could mean uh, the end of miscommunication. Uh, think how much uh, strife and uncertainty uh, has been caused by people misunderstanding each other. Because the only mechanism we have for getting a thought out of my brain into yours 
is my words. And we're, we're constrained by multiple uh, bottlenecks, like my mouth and language uh, and, and eardrums and our filters. But if, it, if we could eliminate all that and just go from, here's my thought, and now you get it, and I know that you have understood, and you know that you have understood that because it's the same thought. Well, the, uh, the potential for how that could enable us to cooperate is on a scale that, that clearly is science fiction at this point, but that I believe that 30 years would be a wildly conservative estimate for, and that if we got out and pushed, we could make it happen in 10. 10 years to achieve the, po the potential for instantaneous, unambiguous communication between not just point to point, but you could hook up, like I could be talking to all of you. We, we could be have that communication between a thousand people at once. It, it, it is a fundamental transformation of the uh, the future of the human race in a way that puts a lot of transhumanistic visions um, that, that makes them seem tame. Uh, and that's a potential. And yes, that can be abused. And will we abuse it? I, I think the message that I give with this, as with everything, is this is coming whether we like it or not. Uh, it's time for us to step up to the bar and be the kind of people that make this happen for the good of all of us. Uh, that brings me to the end. Um, Justin mentioned my first book, uh, which came out five, six years ago. Uh, I have one that came out less than a year ago. And it's got the same name as my podcast. I'm trying for a branding here. Uh, and it's also, and, and so there's the, the path to both of those. And I'll hand this back to our hosts for whatever time we have left for questions. All right. Well, Peter, that was that was awesome. I I took down notes here along the way. I have, I have I have a lot of questions. I'm sure others do as well. But thank you so much for this. I mean, this is very insightful. Um, uh, just some big thoughts for sure to think about. And what I was wondering about, yeah, that that thing about the machine translations, you know, stuff about being able to kind of brain to brain activity. Um, my dad is a physician, he's retired, but he sent me something over like literally just yesterday that really touched on that using FRMI um, uh, to, to, to basically allow, you know, brains to communicate using just essentially like um, changes in, 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 in blood pressure in people's brains. And um, what I'm wondering about is, is, is this the thing that Jeff Hinton's so worried about? I mean, I think us on the outside, we're just thinking about, oh, chat GPT. Uh, or, you know, we, we don't know a lot of these details that you're already, you, you're already sort of taking it to the next level. Um, and as an outside person, it's, it's easy to say, oh yeah, sure. You know, ChatGPT is writing a bunch of stuff for us. We're going to lose, you know, some jobs or whatever, but I don't think people are really thinking about, you know, the full power of large language models. So just kind of off the cuff, I guess what I was wondering is, is, is that, is, is it, is it this next evolution of, of large language models that people aren't thinking about is what's really scaring a lot of these, uh, you know, the, you know, the godfathers of AI in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued by what uh, Hinton might be, uh, react, what, what his agenda might be, uh, because uh, I think it remains to be seen what he's actually going to say, but he seemed to be pretty clear in the CBC interview that he is thinking about the uh, big ex existential type uh, issues and didn't walk that language back uh, anyway. Um, you could have put him and Blake Lemoyne in a room together and I don't think either would have kicked the other out. Mm -hmm. The So we, uh, I, I, I think that's interesting. Um, I, I, there's clearly a sort of AI arms race going on now between major companies. Mm -hmm for jockeying for a huge prize. And, uh, and certainly I would be afraid um, in Hinton's shoes that that's going to put ethics and cybersecurity on the back burner and that we'll end up with an AI house of cards hmm. that 
is dangerous in multiple ways, not necessarily uh, existential threat. Um, and uh, oh, so the, I just want to add to um, Sarath said, what did he, Stephen Hawking use? I assume we're talking about communication when he could no longer speak. Um, mm -hmm. He used something that was um, could pick up movements in a muscle in his cheek. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, if anybody else wants to unmute, go ahead. Yeah, I've got a question for you, Peter. Um, something to kind of blend what you were just talking about in response to Justin, and then maybe a way to segue into what we're seeing a little bit of in the chat here in regards to more regulation and you know pre-crime technology. You had spoken about you know people who are struggling to comprehend AI encouraging them to think about it as a very intelligent human and thinking about, you know, the limitations that can come with a human you're engaging with. But then you also mentioned hallucinations and potential fear of future gaming of hallucinations in language models. And currently I see internet trends on things like TikTok and Twitter where you know, I don't know if it's real or not, but there's people claiming they've been scammed by an AI phone call scam or other kinds of scams. And I have a lot of non-tech people in my life who see a lot of this and have these kind of more realistic everyday concerns of, oh my God, AI is about to get so elaborate with scamming and give people such good tools and access to data. And that is generating a lot of fear that I see in my circles of non-tech people. So I'm curious what you would have to say to those kinds of people or what your opinion is on these types of scams that we're hearing about and where we might be going. First of all, I think it's important to validate their concerns uh, yeah. and that a, a lot of um, developers and technologists have ha have denigrated them made, made and scorned the, that sort of thing, uh, and they shouldn't uh, because there uh, is some validity uh, to that. Now, we can imagine that if that got out of control, that there would be um, a reaction um, that would be correct if in some way either people not using AI and, and that would become to seen as like the 4chan uh, of, uh, of computing or um, it, it, it's a hard field to regulate because it's very hard to draw the boundaries around it, but they would certainly try. The European Union is, is already out there. Um, but um, people like Hinton and Stuart Russell have been proposing frameworks for making AI safer that uh, I imagine uh, not getting the sort of um, priority right now that they would like them to have. And I, I would want them to have more funding. So when I was asked, because uh, I, I was saying recently about the, the AI pause letter, the, uh, the, the um, call for uh, pausing development for six months. Um, I said, that's useless. It's not going to happen. Um, and that was actually a call for pausing the, the training of larger models than GPT-4, which is still maybe not likely to happen. But that, um, so someone said, well, what should we do? And I, I said, Stuart Russell's got a model for uh, building AI that's sort of self-healing in its ethics, fund that. You fund that even a tenth as much as uh, Microsoft puts into Bing, we would be we would jump light years ahead in the development of ethics. Um, and so it's a mess right now, and no one should claim otherwise. and that um, that seems to be the way that we bumble along is by creating one mess after another and eventually fixing it. It's kind of like Homer Simpson. You know, he always seems to end up in some episode saving everyone from a problem that they forgot that he created in the first place. Um, and, uh, and, and, and one of the problems right now is that 
information and changes generating being is happening so rapidly that no one can can track what's going on with large language models. You need a an entire consultancy to do that. Uh, and, and even then, I what we need is an AI to do it for us. I, I think I'm probably not the first person to have this thought, and there's probably six startups working on this as we speak. But um, but that could be one of the most important and useful functions of, of this development is to uh, create AI that helps us manage information because trying to keep up with what's happening, uh, the last four months have demonstrated that a technology is capable of exceeding our ability to adapt. And, and, and so we need to take that back. Awesome. Thanks so much for all that, Peter. That was a very co comprehensive, cohesive answer. It was great. Um, I think I saw Graham had put uh, his hand up. I didn't know if he wanted to say something, but uh, thanks so much for all of that. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll chime in on that. I, I, I agree 100%. I think that the only way that we'll be able to keep one step ahead or even at par with, with an AI is to have an AI policeman of sorts and the and the tricky part about that is then you have to define what it, what the ethics are of that policeman and what it can and cannot do and it's only supposed to apply to other ais so it keeps the other ais in check we'll probably end up with that happening anyway the, the one of the um um the, the ways in which this 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 sort of um, problem and its solutions are debated in academic literature leads to um, um, anti patterns le le leads to to to, to um, un non useful results because an academic paper can typically can consider something in the tightest most narrow focus that it can so that it can produce a useful result so when it comes to Something like making policy, they th th these uh, assumptions often are that there's only that if there's a super intelligence that there's only one, um, that if there's an AGI that there's only one, um, that if we can make a policy that that policy exists everywhere, and, and that doesn't, and, and and somehow it's as binding on China and Russia, and someone living in a, a, a basement in Finland as it is on someone in Minneapolis. And the, the world just isn't like that. How much Hollywood fiction about the in, inception of um, general intelligent AI said that it would be one AI generated by a super genius um, and, and, and that would get all the publicity and no one else would have anything like that. That was never going to happen. There would always be like three from competitors and that's what we've got. And you saw there's 75 projects working on AGI right now. We'll have many, many more. Uh, thank you for that. I definitely, uh, I'm interested to see where, <laughs> where this takes us because it's a, it, it's something that I feel very passionately is gonna change the world for good. And I know that's a little utopian, but uh, if we don't believe that, then it feels like a lot of the people around us that are in the position that you described that are in fear of, of AI, they feel our fear. And then they, I mean, if we're afraid, I mean, why should they even try to <laughs> yeah. well, feel good about it? And, and this gets rapidly into human psychology and uh, that's why I don't like the labels optimism or pessimism. Um, I prefer to be realistic. I'm a, a scientist and an engineer. So what? how does the world work and what can I do to change it? And there are people who during the Cold War and still are whose job was to study um, the likelihood of an all out nuclear conflict that would kill 90% of the people on the planet and make the rest of them uh, their lives in misery. And yet they got out of bed every day and and did this and by and large by not being as um depressed about it as you would think because they had agency they were doing something about it it's much worse for someone who feels like 
this thing could happen to me at any point and I have no choice over it. If you take some agency, if you do something about it, in that case, like dig a fallout shelter, um, then it manages your psychology. So you're like, I'm part of the solution. And, and, and that's my message to people is that you can all be part of a solution here because this affects all of us. Good point. Good point. I see Jim has, uh, has his hand up. Uh, yes. Uh, Hinton said something interesting about how Google had a bunch of these projects sort of lined up, but they weren't ready for prime time yet. So they didn't want to release them. But the competition now from ChatGPT and Microsoft is now causing them to move forward more quickly with those projects. And I think there's uh, an analogy in the military realm, and that is uh, response time can be extremely important with military applications. And I read the other day that the Pentagon is uh, trying to set up various guidelines for using AI and weapon systems. But I think that regardless of what guidelines they set up, they may run into a situation where they may say, well, with this weapon system, uh, we need a very fast response time. And the only way that we're going to get that is by implementing these AI systems within it. And that may turn into an existential, an existential issue. Uh, and so I think that uh, the parameters of the situation may end up uh, overtaking uh, whatever guidelines they try to establish. Mm. Um, that was um, a, a commonly voiced uh, fear during the Cold War. Uh, look at Dr. Strangelove uh, or the movie Failsafe or um, Seven Days in May or, is it, uh, or um, uh, Colossus, the Forbin project. The, the, that um, we might have only minutes to decide and we would have to put uh, that control under a computer. Uh, we didn't. Uh, because we expended a lot of effort on enabling humans to make a decision within the 15 minutes warning that you might get. But AI could make that warning 15 microseconds. And and, and so that, uh, but again, we are speculating about some scenarios that are, um, tend to be more paralyzing than realistic. Uh, and but the, the, your point is is well taken that we could have that kind of arms race. I think to address your first point, Google did not release those. Um, the, well, Google is gun shy because of, of, of things like the bias. I mean, they had a, a photo labeling um, a app that labeled pictures of black people as gorillas. Um, they took a huge hit for that, and they, then it, their response was to re, er, erase the words gorilla, um, chimp, ape um, from the vocabulary of that labeler, um, and still haven't put them back, by the way, and it's been more than five years. The, um, and, and their, like, um, their Lambda project, the, the one that um, Blake Lemoyne conversed with and said it was sentient, almost certainly at least, at, at least as capable as chat GPT, but they didn't make it public. Um, and if they had, I don't think Blake Lemoyne would have gotten as much trouble because he would have been surrounded by people saying, this thing's pretty good, but it's not sentient. Um, and, and and they don't, that they're, they're very afraid of two things. One is negative press and the other is cannibalizing their search um, revenue. Well, chat GPT has cannibalized it for them, so they have no choice. And, and, and so they have to come up with something that somehow um, works. But even when they did release their BARD project uh, uh, pr uh, product for limited release um, to, to just like reporters, and it made a what we would consider a, a trivial mistake about, uh, I think this James Webb Space Telescope, the stock dumped by $130 billion. Um, it was an extreme overreaction. Uh, and, and so you can imagine how cautious they are about doing more things like this, whereas OpenAI has no baggage, nothing to lose from, from going there. Somehow Microsoft gets away with, with this, though. I don't know how. I mean, they released uh, Bing, uh, uh, Bing Chat based on something called Sydney. Um, which was a GPT-4 um, model, 
that insulted and gaslighted users. I mean, read the chats. It it it, it was brutal. Why didn't they a stock tank? Uh, this is a mystery to me. I think because we're starting to get used to these things making mistakes. And so when Google's system made the mistake, it was sort of a new thing that that they would make such a huge mistake. But now we're just seeing mistakes right and left. So um, I suppose, hmm. but actually the 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 uh, Bing chat came happened before uh, Google had the BARD release. Uh, and days, you know, we're, we're talking a matter of days these days, but still. Yeah, it's very interesting. Ralph had asked a question about how do we help non-tech people gain a sense of agency in regards to AI? Mm. Well, uh, that's a great question. And it, it's not through obviously directing the um, development of it, but it's through understanding more about what it is, that it's a pattern maker uh, and a pattern reader. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and that, that's uh, all it is, and it doesn't have volition, um, although there are some projects doing things that are getting scarily close to that. Um, and uh, that, uh, and the high concept here, because we don't have a lot of time, but the, the high concept is that AI reflects our values. And when I've said this for years, that software reflects the values of the company that produced it. You can look at a piece of software from... Apple or Microsoft or Google or Oracle, or and, and you can just take the ethical temperature of the company from the way that software uh, handles exceptions and its error conditions and other things like that. It, well, that's squared with AI. Uh, and ethics is something we can all own. Um, we're all, in a sense, training the next generation of AI because if it's going to learn about human behavior. Well, where is it going to get that from? Just think about what you say to Siri next time and and, and be nice to her. Um, so um, but I, I, there's, I think, a lot of power to be found in organizing. People did dump on Siri and Alexa and abused them with... Um, uh, insulting sexist uh, uh, language that they shrugged off. They were programmed to sit, to giggle uh, in response to that until the Me Too movement out rose up in outrage, and then they introduced safeguards. So that was non-technologists shaping development there, and I, I, I think there's the potential to for more of that kind of uh, development, and it calls for self-organizing of people but you know what the ai gives us the technology to do more of that self-organizing sure yeah i mean chat gpt is there's there's that there's sort of the the base model that's built off of the internet but then there's the you know the human fine tuning that goes on top of it right mm. that, that people need to understand that there is if you didn't have that I think you'd be seeing a lot, you'd be seeing a much different version of ChatGPT. Yes, I feel for the people that do that training. Right. I have a I have a quick question here. So I so Gary Kasparov has a book called Deep Thinking. Um, it's really interesting. He, he's more of a of an autobiography. He talks all about his his history and stuff like that, going against Deep Blue and and sort of the evolution of AI and chess and what was interesting was one of the things that I, I remember him him saying in this book was that, um, in, in his opinion, chess has gotten better because of AI. It's it's actually there's actually people that are watching these moves and saying, "Man, a human would have never done this," and it's actually put a different spin on the game. And what I was thinking about, kind of a, a more sort of like look at the the cup maybe half full, <laughs> or a, a positive spin on it is, you know, could could all of these large language models in AI actually make the human race even better? right? Even hmm. smarter forces us to actually bring something out that's unique that maybe we wouldn't have before in the past. Yes. Just a, just a comment, right? I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Oh, well, absolutely. We should go that way. Uh, I think it, uh, AI is very reflective. It holds up a mirror to us and, and, and 
we don't often realize that, but the way we react to it is a reflection of ourselves. And and you demonstrated that um, you look for you look in the mirror and and see how can we make this thing better, uh, how can it work to our advantage. I love uh, Kasparov's book. Um, I li like Kasparov a, a lot. He's tough as nails, no nonsense. Um, the book is a great read, and you're right that it it made chess interesting, even in an era where no com human can beat a computer. It 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 um, because it found other ways that they could um, learn more about it in the same way that AlphaGo showed people other ways of playing Go. Um, that we necessarily or inevitably interpreted as godlike because we can't look at something playing Go and not think of it as a human, because everything that has played Go in the past has been a human. Uh, and you could say that, you know, it's just rolling a random number generator and coming up with a number that no human ever has before to to do that move. But so what? It's it still helps us. Um, and, and and so there is this uh, prospect, as you say, of using AI as, as we must to improve things. I, I need an AI to help me make sense of what's going on at, at the moment to condense things because uh, I've been trying to keep up and I can't and no one can and 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 so uh, we, we we have to have um, we have to come up with those sort of, of useful things but then the potential for ha a, a world where we're doing different stuff um, and it, it, people ask me at times um, like uh, AI or computers that do uh, map navigation they say well don't won't we lose the skills for reading maps ourselves and navigating ourselves and i say happy to do that mm -hmm. i've done that uh and i want to use that part of my brain for something else now and uh, i'm if i got an ai that can can do that instead and i can find out what's next that's great because if i didn't have the chance to um learn new things by having by being able to forget old ones then I'd still be showing horses before I go out. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and so that's, um, you know, be not afraid. Uh, I, I think is, um, because that won't be, uh, uh, be useful. Yeah. Gives us a chance to evolve. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> For sure. So Henry's got his hand up. We'll we'll take his last question, and then I think we'll we'll call it a night. Henry, you got the floor. Uh, thank you. Are you able to hear me? Yep, we got you. Great. I just wanted to say um, this is a a great discussion. I really appreciate um, uh, everyone's contributions. Um, and my specific question is um, how you might feel about anthropic and its constitutional AI. And, and maybe that pattern being implemented uh, more, more widely, uh, being able to uh, kind of govern, um, you know, a model by, by another model, by providing it its boundaries, uh, you know, using RL AIF. Just wondering if anybody had um, any thoughts on that, thanks. Thanks, I, so I think I need some background. I, I believe I know what you're talking about, uh, and a company, organization and is it anthropic.ai correct correct fill me in on what you're talking about because it's too it's been too long since i looked at it no worries uh, so basically um one of the um, speakers uh, mentioned uh, a basically a governing agent mm -hmm. that uh would you know speak to another model and then the other model uh the lesser model would actually kind of like be governed by the parameters that were provided by the agent and that is happening today mm. um we, we have that with anthropic and um and they have a, a constitutional ai uh kind of almost it's almost i feel it's like a manifesto mm -hmm. uh basically saying hey yeah everyone's afraid of quote unquote you know uh ai you know on the loose but the truth is it doesn't have to be right you you can have a governor um that applies parameters boundaries that you specify and then have a model working mm. within uh, those boundaries similar to other 
um, like uh, patterns in the past where you had, you know, a, one model training another model. Mm. And it's sort of like parent child. I yes. don't, I, I don't know enough about uh, the nuances of that to know where the um, pros and cons are. Um, it, it's easy to look at that superficially and say that you're just shifting the problem from one AI to another. Um, because the ethical boundaries and the governor now are the, the mm -hmm. ones that, that are the concern. Um, yes. I, so I, I, I can't give an opinion on that. Um, I, I've heard more about Stuart Russell's um, approach, which is essentially to say that AI, uh, make AI so that it, it is always in the process of questioning what our preferences are. And if it's not certain, then it doesn't do anything except ask for clarification on what our preferences are so that that it makes it fundamentally align itself with um, our preferences at every step uh, which is obviously a lot of hand waving but it's at a hand wavy sort of level um, and uh, I, I trust that there's more to it because of who he is that's that's worth pursuing so I'd like to see his funding like multiplied by a hundred. All right, got one last question uh, for you. I'm just gonna try and slide this in here. Uh, Lori had a question about, there's a huge opportunity to reimagine education and improve K-12. What, and any thoughts on that? I think maybe she's yes. getting that. Oh, absolutely. Um, like Australian schools banned chat GPT. This is the most short-sighted blink of decision I could imagine. You've got the most transformative tool of our generation and you're going to deny kids the opportunity to learn how to use it. Uh, get out of the way. Um, so you have to, and forgive, no one self-identified as an educator, I think, um, forgive my soapbox here, but the education sector is one of the most backward looking ones there is it desperately needs an enema and the uh, and maybe this will provide it but it's all it, it's geared around um standardized tests right which were a, a perfectly valid way of measuring the prowess of a human being because a human being that can pass the standardized test has the abilities you're looking for um in the same way that the human chess grandmaster has general cognitive abilities of a superior degree. But an AI can pass the test without having the things that you're looking for. Well, their approach is to ban the AI. No, you've got to get better at measuring the thing that you really came for, even if you can't actually put numbers around it. Well, tough luck. Um, find out what it is that humans can do that you're looking for that's uh, not uh, answering multiple choice questions or answering essays. The, uh, we, we've, we've crossed that boundary now and should be no more banning that than you should be making uh, kids do arithmetic with pencil and paper instead of letting them do a calculator and then get onto something more interesting. So we should be teaching them not just how to use today's AI, but what to expect in the AI that will be there when they graduate. That would force educators to get more forward thinking. Nice. Nice, nice. Well, this is great. This 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 was a great conversation. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, reminder to everybody, humancusp.com. That's your that's your website. Uh, you can read all about Peter, um, see his books, um, check out his podcast, also AI and you.net, where is the other um, URL that we can reach out to you and, and connect with you at as well. And uh, thank you again, Peter, for the conversation tonight. This has been this has been great. The hour and a half has gone flown by super fast. And we had all, a lot of really good questions along the way, a lot of good interaction um, from everybody. So thank you for sharing all of your experience and wisdom and, and knowledge here with uh, with the Applied AI community. We look forward thank you. to connecting with you again in the future, for sure. Thank you. I love that. If anyone has uh, any other um, events um, that they're interested in, sorry, I couldn't make uh, yours, Justin, but um, I, I love this sort of thing and would... Uh, uh, be very interested in uh, any other opportunities. All right, for sure. We'll definitely hit you up in the future. Thanks again, everyone. We'll see you the next Thursday, the first Thursday of the month, or we'll see you at the conference next Friday. Have, Have a good night. Time. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everyone.
Take care.